In this tutorial, we'll be looking at how to make this interesting sci-fi landscape. With the new blend file open, you want to eliminate the default cube. <gasps> to create the canyon, we're going to use an add-on that already comes with Blender. You need to go into Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and then search for Landscape, and then enable Ant Landscape. You can also use, save user preferences, but it should do it automatically. Now, when we add a mesh, you have the option to add a landscape. Now, this creates a really nice landscape, but it doesn't look like what we need. So I'm going to change the preset to Canyon. This already looks much better, but we can of course tweak the settings to something that fits our needs better. Before we click off the object, you want to increase the subdivisions. You need to be careful though, because this might be too much for your PC if you go too high. Now that we're done with the canyon, we can add a plane. This is going to be the water. You want to slowly raise it on the z-axis until you're happy with the level. To add those circles around the sphere, we're going to use toruses. So I'm just going to add a new mesh torus. And I'm going to decrease the minor radius by quite a bit. I'm also going to subdivide it and then rotate it on the x-axis by 90 degrees. Now that it's where we want it, you can click Shift S, cursor to select it. This puts the cursor in the middle of the object so we can add an empty. With the torus selected, we can go into the modifier panel. We're going to add an array modifier and uncheck relative offset. What we want to do is use the empty to control the offset. So we need to check object offset and set the object to the empty. You'll see that the new torus created by the array is very big and rotated. So what you need to do is with the torus selected, control A, apply the scale as well as the rotation. What you'll see now is if we change the scale of the empty, it changes the size of the array. What you're going to want to do is increase the count to something like 5, and then slowly scale down the empty. You can also rotate it on the x-axis to something close to 90 degrees. I'm also going to add an icosphere and subdivide it quite a bit. Of course you want to shade smooth both of your objects. At this point you might also want to add a subdivision surface modifier to your landscape. Now it's time for the shading. I'm just going to drag out a new window and set it to the shader editor. With the water selected, I'm going to create a new material and call it water. To make the water, we basically just turn up the transmission and take down the roughness. If we look at it in material preview, you can already see it's nice and reflective. What I'm going to do is add a noise texture and a bump node to get some variation. Now that you're in cycles, you might notice that the water looks kind of weird. What we can do to fix that is go into edit mode and just extrude it down under the lowest point of the canyon. Now it looks much more like water. You probably want to take down the strength of the bump to get something that looks more natural. And with Node Wrangler, you can actually just control shift click on a node to just view its output. And I'm going to take up the scale of this noise. This already looks pretty good. I'm just going to take down the roughness even more to something like 0.06. I'm also going to decrease the strength of the bump. Now we can add the material to the canyons. I'm going to call this material canyons and add a texture coordinate node. What we're going to do is add another separate, uh, separate XYZ node and plug the object into the vector. Now, if you look at the different outputs, the X basically makes a gradient from the X, the Y on the Y, and the Z on the Z of the object. I'm gonna take the Z and plug it into a color ramp. 
What we can do now is use the height to add color variation. What I'm going to do is make the bottom muddy. Then, after that, I'm going to add another node and make this a yellowish brown. I like these nice and saturated because when we add the volumetrics, everything turns very flat. Once you're happy with your colors, you want to tweak the color ramp until it looks nice. Now, if we connect the color to the base color of the principal BSDF, we'll get a really nice looking canyon. I'm also going to add another noise texture for this one, also with a bump, and connect the two up to the BSDF. If you increase the scale of the noise texture, you'll notice that there's quite a lot of distortion. What we can do is add another texture coordinate note and connect the object to the vector. This will fix it, but what we can also do is delete the new one as we already had one and we can actually reuse it. I'm going to increase the scale to something fairly large and also take up the detail. Now we have this canyon with nice looking bumps, but you probably want to take this down as it looks kind of extreme. Right now the canyon reflects too much light, so I'm going to take up the roughness and take down the specular. It might look kind of weird, but later on with the fog, it's going to look all right. Right now it looks kind of weird, but with the fog, it's going to look fine. Now we can select the rings. I'm going to create a new material and call it rings. And this is very simple as we basically just change the color to something blue and take the roughness down a bit. The inside material is kind of interesting because it emits light for all other materials, but to the camera, it looks metallic. To make it, you're going to make a new material, call it inside, and add an emission node. We're going to mix them with a mix shader, but what you'll see is that you can actually see the emission and the principled BSDF. What we want to do is add something that will mix them so that only the camera can see the metallic but the object will see it as an emission. We'll use the light paths node with the is camera ray output. If you connect that to the factor you'll see that to the camera it looks like a principled BSDF but to all other objects it looks like an emission. What I'm gonna do is take up the metallic slider on the BSDF and then turn down the roughness to something like 0.01. Now I'm going to set the emission to something like 75 and set it to something blue. Now we have most of the scene done. At this point, you probably want to find out where your camera is going to be in the end. I'm going to set the focal length to 80. And when choosing the angle, I'm going to choose something nice and low looking up to make this ball look bigger. Our next step is to add the fog. To do this, I'm going to go out of rendered mode as it might slow down the scene a lot. To do this, I'm going to add a cube. I'm going to make it as small as possible while still filling up the whole frame of the camera. Now we can add the material. What I'm going to do is delete the principled BSDF and add a principled volume. This goes into the volume, not the surface, or else you'll get some weird results. I'm also going to disable the denoiser because it doesn't handle these low sample volumes very well. In the camera view, we can now fine tune our density. Now it's time to add the particles. To do that, I'm going to add an icosphere. You want to keep your subdivisions fairly low because in the end, when you're going to use thousands of particles, you can actually end up with quite a lot of vertices. I'm going to move it to the side and scale it down quite a bit. Now we can add a cube, which is going to hold all the particles. Like with the volumetrics, you want to make it as small as possible while still filling up the whole camera. Now it's time to add the particle system. You're going to want to go into the particle properties and add a new system. We want to set it to hair and then check advanced. Under source, you want to change it from emit from faces to emit from volume. What this does is it basically doesn't only spawn the particles at the surface of your object, but also in it. Right now, the particles are rendered as hairs. So what you want to do is under the render, change it to object and select the newest icosphere you added. Now you can see all the particles. I'm going to take the scale down, but as you can see, this is the smallest it goes. So what I'll do is I'll go to the icosphere and just make it smaller. 
Now if we go into the camera, you'll see that they're tiny, but at least now we have more flexibility when choosing the size. I'm also going to increase the scale randomness to something like 0.8. Now if we go into rendered view, you'll see that the volumetrics make the scene very slow. So what you can do is in here, check the display in viewport and display in render. So what I'm going to do is uncheck the viewport for the first cube. This disables the volumetrics in the viewport, but when rendering, it's going to re-enable them. You'll see that the particle emitter is visible. So what you can do is you can disable show emitter in the render, but it's still going to be here in the viewport. So under viewport display, you can also uncheck show emitter. Now we don't have volumetrics and we don't see the cube. This is exactly what we want. The last thing we're going to do is add a material to Icosphere 001, which are the particles that are floating around. This is very simple as it's just an emission. I'm going to make this pink, but like anything else in the scene, you can choose any color you want. At this point, it's probably a good idea to get a test render. Right now, the render looks kind of flat, but in the end, when we do our compositing, it's going to look nice. The HDRI was really good for previewing, but now that the scene is done, we can switch to something more interesting. I'm going to use the new two Blender 2.9 sky texture. We're going to want to delete the HDRI texture and add the sky texture. You can just plug the color into the color, and then I'm going to increase the strength a bit. You can really make this look how you want, but I like a sunset look. These are the settings I've decided upon, but you really want to experiment with this and see what you like. We're nearly ready to do our final render, but before that, you probably want to enable depth of field. So with your camera selected, you want to go to the camera properties tab, and then check depth of field. I'm going to use the eyedropper and set it to the icosphere. So that's in focus. And then I'm going to increase the f-stop to something like 10. I also like to increase these blades to 5, which makes the out-of-focus objects be pentagons. I'm going to render the scene one more time so we can get our compositing ready. Now that the render is done, we can go on to the compositing. I'm going to drag out a new window and set it to the image editor, and then view the render result. You can also use the backdrop, but I, I prefer this method because it's much easier to zoom in and out and pan. Now we can check use nodes. The first thing you're going to do is check the denoising data render path, and then we're going to add a denoising node. You want to plug the denoising normal into the normal and the denoising albedo into the albedo. This will denoise the render so we have a really clean image. Now we can add a glare node. Now it's time to add the glare node. Because Cycles doesn't support Bloom, this is a really easy method to substitute it. Now I'm going to add the RGB curves node. What this allows me to do is increase the contrast of the image by adding an S curve. What you'll notice is right now the preview is very slow because of the denoise node. So what I'm going to do is with Node Wrangler installed, select the denoise and glare and tap M. This will disable them, so the image will look noisy, but it's fine because it's faster. Once you're happy with this, you're going to want to add a Sunbeams node. You want to connect the denoising image output to the Sunbeams node, because if you connect this image output, it's not going to be denoised. Now I'm going to connect the image to the image, just, just so we can see the output. To see anything, you need to increase this ray length. I'm going to set it to 0.1, but once I'm done, of course I'm going to look back at it and see what works better. What you want to do is set these x and y values so that the rays come from where the sun is. This will make it more realistic, as if the glare comes from a different direction than the sun, then it just looks off. Once the suns are aligned, you want to add a mix node. I'm going to drop it between the sunbeams and the composite output and then drag the RGB curves into the first input. This is going to drop down the sunbeams node, but what you'll see is when the factor is at 1, you only get the sunbeams output. What you want is for them to be overlaid on top of each other. So I'm going to change this mix mode to add. You can decrease the factor until you're happy with the result. And with this, you really need to balance the ray length with the factor. 
A higher factor gives brighter beams, but a longer wavelength gives longer beams. Now it's probably also a good idea to unmute these by tapping M again when having them selected. And this is going to take a while, but now you can see your final result. The last node we're going to add is a lens distortion node. This is going to go between our glare and RGB curves, and you probably want to disable all of the other nodes again just to fine tune this. We're just going to change the dispersion. And what that does is it just separates the RGB channels and offsets them by different amounts from the center. What you want to do is check this fit just to get a flatter looking image. I'm also going to duplicate this node and put it between the sunbeams and the add. Now we can unmute all the nodes. I'm going to decrease the dispersion to something like 0.05 and we'll see what happens. You really don't want to exaggerate with this because it can really look over edited in the end. Once you're happy with all of these values, we can do our final render. Once you're happy with your results, we can increase the render samples. I'm going to set mine to 500, but it really depends on the look you're going for and how dense your volume is. With the camera selected, just tap R and turn it a bit. This will just add scale to the scene. Now we can increase our render samples to 500 and tap F12. Now that the render is done, you can just fine tune your compositing. And there you go. That's how you make the simple sci-fi scene. I encourage you to play with the settings and see what results you get. Here's an example of the same scene I made using different settings. I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial. See ya!